Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ecology Live from the British Ecological Society. I'm Pete Manning of the Senckenberg Biodiversity and Climate Change Research Centre in Frankfurt in Germany, and I'm also the chair of the BES's uh, events committee. Um, so the BES is uh, the biggest ecological society in Europe with um, 6,000 members in uh, 120 countries, and we set up the Ecology Live series uh, so that you can enjoy great talks during the lockdown period um, and hear the latest ecology even when you're working from home. So thanks a lot for joining today. Um, we've got at least 650 people and they're coming into the room right now very rapidly. So there's been an enormous interest in the um, uh, series and I thank you all for joining. We have people joining from all over the world. Um, Today, uh, our speaker is Natalie, Natalie Petterelli. And before I hand over to her, I just want to say a few things about how um, to answer questions. Uh, there's a questions and answer box. If you um, put your questions in there, then we'll select a few questions to ask Natalie at the end of the session. We will also collect up the questions and ask a few of them um, to Natalie, who will answer them on the YouTube video, which we're filming right now. And uh, you can uh, hopefully see more of the answers to her questions there. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Natalie, and she's going to talk about uh, the application of remote sensing in ecology today. So thanks, and over to Natalie. If he says whoosh, okay. Um, so I'm Natalie Petrelli. I'm a senior research fellow working at the Institute of Zoology um, at the Zoological Society of London. And today I decided to talk to you about two papers I did with uh, Maylis Lopez, with, who did um, a postdoc with me for two years. And we were really interested in the use of a uh, time series uh, for, lo for long cover mapping and whether or not uh, it's a good idea to do that uh, and how it can improve ecology. Um, to start with, I thought um, we could just go back to thinking about maps and, and why maps are important. I don't know about you, but I grew up with maps um, with my dad. When we, went, we were going on holiday, I was always the co-pilot and the maps were the way to know where to go on holiday, where to choose which route. So, so I really loved map from early on. And it's not just me, it, maps have been quintessential to advance human knowledge support decision making and this for for thousands of years um land cover maps are a type of maps that tell you about where you can find crops lawns grasslands forests lakes any kind of class of physical coverage that we can find on earth and here is a is an early map for australia uh, where you can see mostly was drawn by hand Land cover maps are, are really important in ecology. Uh, and I know, and I, I would bet that many of you have used or will use land cover map, whether you do movement ecology and species distribution modeling to know um, what, what's the preferred habitat of your species or where are the corridors, and whether you look at disturbance ecology and what's the impact of fire or you are into ecosystem red listing and ecosystem dynamics, just knowing where ecosystems are or um, how their distribution change o o over time, all of that requires land cover mapping. Land cover maps are also extensively used in conservation biology to support decision making where to put a protected area, or to, uh, for impact assessment, such as, is this um, a measure working? Is this protection working? Now, something that many do not wonder that much is how do we actually produce those long cover maps that, that we all use, or many of us use. So nowadays, we don't really draw long cover maps by hand, such as the previous example in Australia. We, we primarily rely on a satellite imagery. And the process in, in most situations consists in taking one satellite image um, and then uh, combine it with some field data. Make sure that you pre-process the satellite image to remove any kind of terrain correction or cloud. And then bring this information together to do some automatic mapping of long, long cover. You can do that in an unsupervised way by kind of clustering uh, the information that looks the same and creating a class based on that. Or do a supervised classification, which is what you do when you're using field data. And in that uh, situation, you decide how many long cover classes there should be 
in your satellite imagery. And then that automatic mapping is generally validated by using external independent uh, information, uh, either from on the ground or from other source of very high resolution satellite imagery. But, but what about those satellite images? Where, where do satellite images come from? Uh, one thing that, that uh, sometimes uh, is not very well appreciated is that there's a lot of different type of satellite um, that capture information in that uh, electromagnetic spectrum that you can see on the top of, uh, of that slide. And so two type of sensors are generally distinguished. The passive sensors, and the active sensors. Now the passive sensors basically uh, capture uh, the, the amount of light that has been emitted by the sun, went on Earth and then got reflected back to space. Um, so it relies on the sun as a primary source of energy to inform uh, the, ultimately those plant cover classification. Those active sensors, on the contrary, they, they basically send a beam of energy from space, from the satellite, and then they capture uh, what comes back. And the information about land cover is derived from the difference between what has been emitted and what's coming back. Within the passive sensors, there's generally a distinction made between uh, the multispectral and the hyperspectral. Multispectral being those sensors that capture information in relatively broad band of the electromagnetic spectrum. So big green, red, blue band. While the hyperspectral really capture inf information in a lot, uh, quite a lot of those very narrow bands. There's also a distinction, or sometimes people talk about optical imagery. Optical imagery being images that have been captured within the visible and in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then in active sensor, the two main type of sensors that people have heard about are the radar and the LIDAR. So radar is an active sensor that uses microwaves. So it sends a microwaves beam, capture what comes back and derive information about land cover based on the difference between the two. And uh, while LIDAR use uh, a laser. What's interesting here is, and is important to remember for later on is that um, those multispectral sensor, those passive multispectral sensors that are very known are Landsat and Sentinel-2, and they are, um, they can be contaminated by cloud. So if there's a cloud between the sensor and whatever you're trying to take a picture of, what you're going to see is a cloud. On the contrary, if you look at active sensor and radar in particular, so uh, famous um, satellites or sensors that are radar based, of, for example, Pulsar or Sentinel-1, those ones are not affected by cloud, so they can see through cloud. Um, so most of the information that we use to do land cover uh, come uh, are uh, from passive sensors, multispectral uh, type of sensors, so either Landsat and something else. And recently, there's been more and more information coming from radar sensors, particularly uh, with uh, Sentinel-1. And so what's interesting is that uh, there's been a lot of change recently as to what's available to uh, land cover mappers and ecologists when it comes to uh, satellite uh, remote sensing. First, into, um, since 2014, there's been a huge uh, increase in the availability of free imagery uh, that combine both high uh, spatial resolution, so 10 meter or so, and high temporal resolution with up to 30 pictures per year. And that's through the Copernicus program, which basically uh, covers the Sentinel-1 and 2 satellites. And that has increased the opportunity to use seasonal variation uh, to inform land cover mapping. At the same time, there's also been uh, uh, in the ability to get co-registered information in the optical and radar domain. So that means images that are taking uh, in the same place so that the spatial color registration is very easy, has been boosted because uh, of Sentinel-1 and 2, um, which, which basically facilitate that course registration. And that means that it's much more easy to use both information from radar and from uh, the, um, the multispectral, the Sentinel-2, together to inform land cover mapping. And that, again, could potentially mean an increased opportunity to combine information from different sensors to, to do better maps. 
And then on top of that, there has been some progressing techniques and algorithm to process uh, uh, satellite remote sensing images. So all of this together mean that potentially um, there, there's, there's quite a good opportunity to access and, and produce better land cover maps uh, by using all this new technology and all this new information. Now, you may say it's not because something is there that it's a good idea to do it. And so the question is, is it really a good idea to combine all this information, to use all the information to make uh, uh, better maps? What's the rationale to think that it could indeed make better maps? Well, the first is that um, the information captured by those Sentinel-2, those optical uh, passive sensors, and the information captured by radar sensors is, is completely different because one tells you something about uh, the color, uh, while the other one is much more about the 3D structure. So this means that fundamentally this, uh, this information is complementary. So uh, putting them together could really uh, give some good ground for, for improving your land cover classification. The second thing is that most land cover classes um, have different annual temporal signature. There's, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of differences in how a savanna look like in the dry season and in the wet season. Um, so getting information about those temporal variation within a year to inform your land cover classification could mean that you get better at detecting uh, those land cover classes that, that are characterized by those annual variations. And then the third thing is that we do work in a lot, um, or at least we, and either one that works in a, in a, in a conservation hotspot, tend to work in, in uh, areas that, that are affected by clouds. And so for the moment, a lot of the land cover maps are, are only using the optical passive information, uh, which means that they, they get the problem of having to deal by cloud. And so combining with radar and taking into account all these huge, um, information in the temporal domain means that you could uh, get better at dealing with clouds. But all of that, you may say, sounds quite complicated um, and there's, it looks like there's a lot of things to do. So is it really worth? To which extent is it worth? Uh, and that's the question that uh, we started to, to ask uh, with Melis um, in two different settings. So the first one uh, was uh, thanks to a collaboration uh, with uh, um, Jane Hill in York, uh, who had a project in Jambi, Sumatra, and was really interested in mapping peatlands. And we, we used that uh, study case to look at what's the cost and benefits associated with trying to map land cover in the wall of the Jambi region using more or less complex approaches. Um, so the site, uh, which is in Indonesia on Sumatra, um, is characterized primarily by a relatively low level of seasonality, but a lot of cloud. And so what we did there was to try to map land cover in the region by comparing uh, what was happening, whether we use only Sentinel-1, so radar information, or uh, Sentinel-2, so uh, multi-spectral passive information uh, with 10 bonds, while focusing on our ability uh, to map peatlands uh, to inform Jane's project. And then the other thing that we did was to try to see whether there was any um, benefits in using um, a multi-temporal approach, so using all the available information uh, for a given year in the radar and uh, in the optical domain versus using a monotemporal approach, but basically a temporal average for the year we were considering which was 2017. And then compare those monotemporal and multitemporal approach with the fusion of both either monotemporal or multitemporal approach. So what we did more specifically look like to spend time trying to explain that. But, but what's really important is that, the, that you can recognize the steps uh, I was mentioning early on, which is we had a pre-processing step to try to deal with atmospheric correction, terrain correction. Then we had a classification step, which is basically interpreting the information captured by pixels in satellite images and to, 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 to map that so that you, it's, you know which pixel belongs to which land cover. Then produce a land cover map and then validate, which is the last step. 
uh, the, the land cover map produce. So the, 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 the area we were considering uh, had uh, 1.5 million pixels. And we had to create using very high resolution uh, imagery, independent imagery, reference data that ultimately covered 1.2% of the study area. And the classifier we used in this um, example, so the, the algorithm we used to, to classify pixel was a random forest. So what did we found? Um, the first thing we found was that uh, when you use the full information of the time series, when, when you use all the images, um, you get a significantly higher classification accuracy. And that's particularly true for radar with plus 14 something percent improvement. Also true for Sentinel-2, so the optical passive multispectral. Uh, and also for uh, the fusion of both, the combination of both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. So in all cases, uh, in, this, in this example, it was a good idea uh, to use the time series as opposed to just use monotemporal information. What, uh, in this situation also, it was, um, it, we had better accuracies when we uh, combined the information uh, by Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, time series as opposed to just using one type of information. So both using um, time series and using fusion uh, resulted in um, better maps, more accurate maps. So, um, and that uh, was particularly uh, true for uh, some land cover categories. So here is a table that gives you the user accuracy and the producer accuracy for each land cover that we uh, considered, which is forest, water, urban, palm, acacia, fern, bear, and mangrove. And it compared those accuracy for Sentinel-1 monotemporal, Sentinel-1 time series, sorry, Sentinel-2 monotemporal, Sentinel-2 time series, and then Sentinel-1 and 2 monotemporal on fusion or um, uh, the, times, the fusion of the time series. And there's two a possibility for the fusion of the time series because in one case well, we did a bit of a sorcery to, to uh, account for the cloud uh, to slightly improve the accuracy and what you can see is that um, in general using the time series was a really good idea um, it was was also interesting to see that most uh, long cover classes uh, reach their highest accuracy when combining sentinel one and sentinel two time series so this was an example uh, in Sumatra, uh, not that much seasonality, lots of clouds. Um, and we thought, well, what happens if you go into the opposite uh, type of situation where there's not that much cloud, um, but there, there's quite some seasonality. Um, and um, they are, um, there's, there's a long cover classes that are really uh, difficult to separate. So here is a second example in the Penjeri National Park in Benin. Um, so um, the uh, situation here is um, that um, there's a, a long a, a project going on uh, with a, a number of partners, but primarily also Sarah Durant, um, where uh, we have been uh, looking at wildlife and uh, the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, using uh, various approaches. But one thing that we were particularly interested in was to try to see whether we could get better at mapping savannas. Because uh, the map we had uh, access when we started the project was basically making the difference between uh, woodland and savanna. And, and uh, there wasn't really much variability in the type of savanna. Well, savanna. well if you go on the ground, you can really see um, something that looks more like a grass savanna where you have no shrubs or tree at all, a shrub savanna, a tree savanna, and a woodland savanna, and you have a picture of the four of them. And uh, the maps that were available at that point were mixing all those four categories into one. So we wanted to see whether we could develop an approach that would get better at mapping the, the, the cover of those uh, different uh, long cover type of savannas. Um, so the protect, uh, so the Penjeri National Park is a protected area of around 3,000 square kilometer. And uh, um, for the rest, the fact that it's seasonal, a low level of cloud coverage have been um, uh, 
uh, introducing. So here, what we were trying to do was the same as before, is it worth getting complicated? But uh, we, we became even more obsessed to try to see whether we, what was the benefit of, of uh, go, getting hyper complex versus just a little bit more complex versus not complex at all. So here we compared the benefits and the costs of, of comparing, of, of having just one image versus a few image versus the wall time series. And we uh, also looked at the benefits of adding bands. So if you think about Sentinel-2, it captures information in a number of bands. And to do your classification, you can use some of the bands or all of the bands. And we were trying to see, and of course that has a computational time cost. So we're trying to see what's the benefits uh, of considering all of them versus just some of them. Um, so here what we did was again play with Sentinel-1 and 2. And while really focusing on our ability to map the different type of savanna, and we compared monotemporal, which was one day, versus multi-temporal, which is six images per year, versus hypertemporal, which is more than 30 images uh, per year, informing the long cover classification. We also compare uh, the combination of Sentinel 1 and 2 uh, using a monotemporal, multi-temporal, or hypertemporal approach. And finally, we compared uh, what was happening when we were using just four bands uh, out of uh, the 10 plus monitor, the, the, the number of bands uh, monitored by Sentinel-2 versus four bands and the NDVI, which is the normalized difference vegetation index, tells you something about the greenness, versus uh, considering 10 bands uh, for Sentinel-2. So again, here is a, a schematic version of, of what we did. Um, again, you can see that it mostly consists in doing some pre-processing, a classification validation, and then some comparison using here with Cox and Tex. Um, what we did in terms of timing, we considered all the images from February 2018 to February 2019. And um, we used to inform our validation, but also our uh, classification, we used ground truthing uh, data that was collected in the National Park in January 2019, plus some additional information uh, collect, uh, derived from Google Earth. So what did we find? Uh, again, we found uh, that uh, uh, time series were really improving uh, your ability to map long cover. Actually, the combination of Sentinel-1 and 2 time series performed as well as the time series of Sentinel-2 alone in terms of classification accuracy. What was interesting, however, is that uh, fusing or combining uh, Sentinel-1 and 2 led to quant qualitatively better maps, so the neater maps. Um, what's for sure is that the use of dense optical time series, so that hypertemporal more than 30 image, significantly improved the classification outcome as to compare to using only a few image or one image a year. Um, we also uh, found uh, that a different long cover type were helped differently or the accuracy changed differently depending on whether you were using um, a combination of approach or not, so combining something out one or two, or if you're choosing one bun, six, uh, six, uh, sorry, uh, four bun or ten bun, or one image, six image, or 43 image. So here uh, you have um, a representation of the accuracy for each of the long cover type considered for Sentinel to. Um, uh, four bands, whether it's one image, six image, or 43 image, or Sentinel to 10 bands, whether it's one image, six image, or 43 image. And so what's interesting here is first to see that whatever the method you're using, uh, mapping shrub savanna was, was quite difficult and it, it wasn't really accurate. Uh, fusion, so combining, combining radar and um, um, Sentinel-2 particularly help with grass savanna and tree savanna mapping uh, around 4% gain in accuracy and time series that had a particularly high impact uh, uh, for some long cover types of particularly the temporary wetlands as you can see which went from something around an F of 24 something to up to 80 uh, for something so um, the more temporally variable the more your time series is helping so what's the key message from that presentation? Um, the absolutely most important one is to, you should always wonder uh, how the things we use, whether they are maps, algorithm or data, um, uh, how have they, made, have they been made? Um, 
hard they've been collected because that tells you something as to whether you're using the best product or the best approach uh, for what you're doing. If we look at this particular situation about time series and, uh, and uh, fusion, um, what we can say is that it's mostly always a good idea to use a time series, uh, the optical one, um, to improve the accuracy of your long cover map. And the more images, the better. Um, however, using more bands doesn't always mean better classification outcomes. Well, that's particularly interesting when you're thinking of your, uh, about your computation time. Going from four, four bands to 10 bands didn't really make a, an enormous difference in your ability to map your long cover types. Um, on the contrary, combining radar and optical time series is generally a good idea, although not systematically and depending on the relative importance of temporal variation versus 3D spectrum. Um, the other thing to remember, or that I think this, this work shows, is that um, yes, we did something that was a bit more complex than just classifying one image. But uh, when you think about it, the approach actually saved time because there was no manual compositing to try to remove the clouds, particularly when we were working in jungle. And it was therefore much less sensitive to human errors. Also, um, uh, those uh, advances that, that we've been discussing are really accessible right now. All of what we did was done on, on free software and with free data. And to conclude, I would say that our work clearly demonstrates that doing those efforts and to go beyond the classical classical approaches did pay off for us um, and ended up um, uh, getting us access to uh, much better information about long cover types. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, if you want to read more about this, this um, those two papers that have been published this year in Remote Sensing in Ecology and Conservation and Methods in Ecology and Evolution. And if the, this talk was terrible, there's even a little uh, video which is much more, uh, which, which explains in a much more friendly manner uh, what we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm not sure if you can see me. My video, for some reason, is not coming on. But um, uh, I will switch. And we'll switch to questions now. Um, it seems that my video is not going to show me, so I'm just going to have to hear me instead. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a very general question, which is uh, how do you determine the accuracy of your uh, uh, remote sensed uh, land cover maps? So you'll need some uh, independent information. So information you haven't used uh, to um, classify your satellite image. So extra information. And then basically you're looking at whether uh, your map um, um, correctly identify area that you know are either mangrove, savannas, forest, etc. So you'll need some independent information to validate them. And then you look at the coherence between what your map tells you and what your independent information tells you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and another question would be, what are the risks in using this type of remote sensed map to guide environmental decision making? Is it, what, is it safe to do so, or is the uncertainty high? Well, um, there, there is, is always uncertainty with, uh, with doing anything. <laughs> but um, better maps that are more accurate reduce um, that risk. And so that presentation showed that the more information you use, especially given the information available right now, the more you can reduce that uncertainty. Um, and so, so therefore, you're less likely uh, to derive wrong conclusion uh, from that long cover map. Thanks a lot. So we have um, a number of questions of people asking, um, is it possible to do this type of remote sensing over water, for example, to monitor productivity? So to, yes, um, so the, um, there is a number of products that allow you to, um, to look at uh, the variation in, uh, in um, sea productivity. Um, um, but that comes from the information on the a very top layer of the water surface. Um, and so all the organisms that, that, um, uh, that are primary producer, you can estimate the pr primary productivity using uh, satellite information. But you can't go uh, below that. So satellites do not see underwater. They only see the, what's happening at the top layer of the surface in terms of primary productivity. 
Thanks a lot. And then again, another question which has come up as a recurring theme is what free software and what free data sets at the global level are available to do this type of work? So we did uh, a lot of it in R. Um, um, all the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 are free uh, of access uh, from, um, from the Copernicus program. Um, there is also a number of um, other algorithms, um, some of which we cite in those papers that are free of access. So it depends a bit that there's a number of, uh, of um, approach that you can do, but um, um, a lot of them now are available for free, so open access and open source. But uh, you can do it in R or on Google Engine. Okay, so um, with that, I think uh, our half hour time slot is up. Uh, I'd just like to finish by um, thanking you um, uh, for the great talk, this brilliant insight into um, the application of remote sensing in ecology. So thanks again. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well, everyone that's with us. Uh, our next talk next week is by Thomas Crowther from ETH Zurich, who's going to be talking about how whether trade-offs in functional traits help us to understand global bi biogeochemistry. If you're interested in seeing today's, today's talk again, then have a look. We'll be posting the video up on YouTube, and we'll also be um, addressing more of your questions. There was just way too many um, to possibly answer them all uh, in this short session. Uh, but um, Natalie will be addressing some of your questions in the responses to the YouTube video. So with that, thanks again for joining us, um, and hope to see you all again next week. Thanks. Goodbye.